<clears throat> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Howdy ho, boys and girls. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 20. I am your host, the Honorable Rish Outfield. And I am the Dishonorable Big Anklevich. That farting sound is R-O-8-O-T. And the announcer man couldn't be here today. He just recorded his lines and then emailed them to us. Today's Halloween story, is it? <laughs> yes. Oh, shoot. Why didn't I prepare? Today's Halloween... Oh, screw it. Today's Halloween story is Mother's Harvest by Alex Moisey. Alex Moisey has been battling his laziness for almost three years, occasionally producing a story that is worthy of seeing the daylight. The other stories are locked in his basement, where they will hopefully remain forever. Zoom <laughs> Jack! For infrequent and poor updates on his status, check out www.draken.co.nr. Wait, what? What might NR stand for? I've been been wanting to use this the whole time. I'm sure I don't know. Oh. Never had the opportunity to use that before. Yeah, it's nice we can finally work that in. Also, you can hear another one of his stories, The Artist. We ran it here ourselves in April. Good stuff. We'd like to thank Julie Hoverson for lending her voice to today's episode. Uh, Julie does a great podcast over at 19 Nocturne Boulevard. They put together some really cool audio dramas. You should check that out. The uh, links are in the show notes. And also today's music is by, again, Roger Subarana, because his stuff is so great. So check that out, too. There's links. Mother's Harvest by Alex Moisey. Good morning to you, Mrs. Rose. Oh, it's a wonderful morning indeed, bless the Lord. The old lady in the baby blue dress waved back with a wide smile. It wasn't like her to feel so joyous, but today she had every reason to thank the Almighty and smile. There wasn't a single cloud in sight, and her arthritis had lessened its pains to a dull hum. Even her back felt fine. And, as if that wasn't enough, counting today, there were just two days until Halloween, and that meant her grandsons would arrive at the train station within the hour. The old lady thought of Alex and Jake with great fondness. She had missed their smiles painfully when they couldn't visit her last year. For a while, her mind was even filled with dread at the thought that they might cease seeing her altogether and break the tradition dearest to her heart. However, in the end, just as every year since Jake was seven and Alex five, the week of Halloween was assigned as her time with the two darling angels. She had been so relieved to hear that all travel arrangements were done. It took years of bitter fights with her daughter before the tradition could be established. Those days were still fresh in her mind, and she feared a rematch. You can't live alone in that hick town. Dahlia had screamed. What if you get sick or one of those damn spiders in your garden bites you? What then? I wouldn't be alone if you hadn't left. Mrs. Rose replied, her lips pressed into a thin line of determination. Oh, so I should have kicked that opportunity to go to a private school so I could stay in Pine Valley and become a what? A store clerk? A farmer? There isn't even a hospital in the whole city, for God's sake. Look, Mama, just move with me to Nashville and... Mrs. Rose stomped her foot on the floor. You move here or visit more often. I haven't seen the kids in two years. It went on and on, each as stubborn as the other. Finally, Mrs. Rose agreed to have a doctor's opinion every three months and move into the big city as soon as he declared her unable to cope on her own. In return the kids would visit her for a whole week every year. They don't even have a break in October. I'd have to take them out of school. Dahlia protested. What about sometime in August? Too hot, Mrs. Rose replied. 
decided to have her own way on this one. Halloween is so nice around here, don't you remember? There's all the decorations, and other kids come to visit too. I could even take them to church for the All Saints sermon and maybe walk in the woods. Everything looks so beautiful in October. Dahlia threw her hands in the air and resigned with a sigh. Halloween was to be spent at Grandma's house after all. The old lady smiled at the memory of that triumphant day almost seven years ago. She had to fight hard, but the prize more than made up for it. One week, just for her and the two angels, with their pretty blonde hair and those eyes the color of the sky. Oh, those dreamy eyes that reminded her so much of her Harold, God rest his soul. One week, just... The thought of Harold stuck to her like a fly caught in a spider web. Annoyed, Mrs. Rose quickly glanced at the city hall tower. The clock showed 9.15, which meant she had plenty of time to remember Harold and light a candle in his name. She should say a prayer for fair days and a good harvest season anyway. With the smile back on her face, she approached the small Pine Valley Catholic Church and pushed open the heavy wooden doors. She crossed herself three times and quickly whispered a prayer. Retrieving a candle from her purse, she always made sure to carry a few, Mrs. Rose approached the altar with small steps. The church was empty, but listening to her own heartbeat, painfully loud in the solemn presence of the Holy Spirit, she somehow felt surveyed. It wasn't really surprising, though. The old lady was certain God kept watch over his house, observing those within through the eyes of the many saints painted on the tall walls. Well aware that God was watching, Mrs. Rose lit the candle, crossed herself, and hesitated a moment before kneeling and kissing the sacred ground. God rest, Harold, and give me the strength to fulfill my duties, she prayed before leaving. Once outside, Mrs. Rose sighed with relief, ah, feeling somehow lighter and at peace with herself. Harold never understood why she visited the old church so often. He even called it stupid superstition once. But that was after he was all rotten and filled with evil, so it wasn't really his fault. But enough of Harold for now, she decided, leaving the steps of the church. Now it was time to pick up the two angels and have a wonderful week filled with fun. She had already planned a trip to a farmer's market, a harvest festival, and a newly opened petting zoo a bit upstate. Alex would love to see the animals, she thought smiling, and she wanted to head up north anyway with her usual business this time of the year. Two birds with one stone, as her mother used to say. And when they returned home, in the evenings, if the weather was good, they could all watch the stars from the front porch, telling stories and drinking hot cocoa. Jake loved to hear about his mom when she was young, before she got her mind set on leaving Pine Valley in her chase for a better-paying job. The Amtrak locomotive screeched to a halt in the small train station, and soon Mrs. Rose could see two tall boys unloading their suitcases. She recognized her grandson's blonde hair immediately, but hesitated, seeing how much they had grown in just one year. Alex had turned 12 a month ago, and Jake was 14, but they were both taller than she was at 5'6", and they looked so handsome, the baby fat all gone from their tanned cheeks. They weren't kids anymore. They were young men she could be proud of. A tear gathered in the corner of her eye as she waved to them. Such wonderful angels they were. Hey, how's it going, Grandma? Jake asked while hugging her. I'm so glad to see you too, Mrs. Rose responded, hugging Alex now. You don't have your car with you? The boy asked, looking around disappointed. Yeah, it would be sweet if we could bum a ride, Jake agreed. The old woman felt a tug at her heart, seeing those unhappy looks. But boys, it's such a nice day, and you know I live just twenty minutes away. We can see the Halloween decorations in the city square on our way. The two started dragging their suitcases in silence, while Mrs. Rose followed, cursing her decision to walk to the train station. Why did they even need two suitcases each? A voice very much like Harold's asked her. Mrs. Rose quickly chased that nagging thought away. They didn't look it, but in their hearts, they were just kids. They had probably packed all their favorite toys, she decided. Sadly, she soon found out that was far from the truth. None of the games they used to love just a year ago were in those suitcases. Not the rollerblades she sent them for Christmas, or the juggling balls and hula hoops, or the painting kit and construction set she bought for the two angels on their last visit. Instead, 
there was a black box. They spent an hour connecting to her TV, all the time muttering about analog and channel selection, and once even cursing her small TV set. Mrs. Rose pretended not to hear the muttered curses, busy in the kitchen, but she also decided there would be no cocoa that evening. When they finally got that black box to work, Alex and Jake spent the rest of that wonderful sunny day shooting some make-believe monsters with a gun-shaped controller. As the hours passed, Mrs. Rose silently watched them lying on the floor of her living room, killing some awful creatures and cheering each other onwards. She brought them sandwiches for lunch, and they wolfed them down, carelessly leaving the plates on the floor. She called them to dinner, and they ate, talking about high scores and power-ups. And finally, she lay awake to the music they played until close to midnight and listened to their giggles and muffled insults. Shoot like a sissy. Screw you. You couldn't even kill a third-level ghost. And so on. Mrs. Rose was still awake when silence finally settled in their room on the second floor. It was the blessed silence of sleep, and for a second or two, nothing dared bother it. Then whispers began floating in her dark room, following unseen currents of memories from long ago. One at a time, they lounged forward at old Mrs. Rose, turning into strong voices from her past. Look, Mama, they're sick. Dahlia had said on the phone. The doctor isn't sure what it is, and I don't want to risk another infection. I'll send them over in July, okay? Her daughter's voice repeated the promise she never fulfilled. One whole year passed by without Mrs. Rose seeing her little angels at all. And now... They're They're snotty teenagers. teenagers. That's That's what they they are. are. Harold's voice filled the room. Nothing Nothing but but lazy, good-for-nothing teenagers. The old lady pressed her eyes shut wishing the voices away. She began muttering an old protection prayer, but slipped into a dream by the second verse. Harold's voice chased her, turning her night into a nightmare filled with evil things like the black box and the make-believe monsters. That ain't right. That ain't right at all. Good morning, boys, Mrs. Rose said, entering their room on the second floor. Five minutes came the reply. For a second, she stood in the doorway, ignored and forgotten. It was already noon, and she had thrown away the lovingly made breakfast. She feared that soon lunch would follow in the trash bag. Harold's voice, which had been still for so long before, cackled impishly for the third or fourth time in just two days. (laughs) Boys Boys need their their sleep, sleep, don't they? they? It'll be all better when they wake up, Mrs. Rose promised herself. Yet again, she was proven wrong. Alone, she remained to carve the Halloween pumpkins while the two boys ran through the woods. Alone, she drank her tea on the front porch as they flew a remote-controlled helicopter in the backyard. And what could she say? Boys were bound to be boys. It's not their games that are bothering you. You have something else on your mind, don't you? Her mother's voice asked. We We are are protectors of the the good good in this evil, infested world. Just remember what we know, and know know it in your heart. The voice gave its advice. Hey, Grandma! Alex suddenly called from the backyard. There was urgency in his voice, and Mrs. Rose felt a tingle of fear as she hurried to her special little garden. Do you have some bug spray? The boy asked as soon as he laid eyes on her. Jake found a nest of spiders! Out of breath, the old woman stopped for a moment. She knew very well where the nest was. She always carefully avoided it when trimming the rose bushes. Spider webs looked so pretty between the red flowers, delicate threads that sometimes caught the raindrops in such wonderful patterns. Besides, those spiders were God's creatures, put on earth to heal it from the evil touch of flies and other parasites. The thought of killing them never crossed her mind. Never mind... Jake said, stomping the ground with his thick boots. They probably haven't even heard of bug spray in this town. He added under his breath, all the while killing away. Mrs. Rose wasn't sure what hurt more. His implied insult and Alex's barely concealed snicker, or the mask of hatred on Jake's face as he continued to stomp the fleeing spiders. She could almost hear the cries of fear as the boy jumped and sidestepped with his eyes fixed on the ground. He was bringing death and sorrow with a smile that made her flesh shiver. 
he looked so evil. Harold's voice completed her thought. Evil, evil, evil. It yelled in her old ears with diabolic pleasure. She walked away, unable to see or hear more. That night, Mrs. Rose made no hot cocoa. She didn't even wait for the two children to finish dinner. She took her tea and drank it on the front porch, in the cool yet pleasant breeze of late October. Oh, Lord, if only that wind could blow away the evil she saw. There was so much that still needed to be prepared for tomorrow and the busy month of November. But all she could think of was Jake's smile as he was killing God's creation. If anything was going to get done, she had to make a decision. Watching the stars, Mrs. Rose listened to the many voices trailing through her mind and slowly drove them away one by one until, finally, a smile blossomed on her old face. By the time she went to bed, she knew what was to be done, and no nightmares bothered her that night. In the morning, she kept busy. She made two pumpkin pies and finished the carving of the one jack-o'-lantern she had left over from yesterday. She even bought another bag of candy and some fake spider webs that she hung all over the front porch. It looked so corny compared to the real webs, which took weeks to complete. But for last-minute decorations, she decided it would do. Why didn't you tell us you were carving pumpkins? We would have helped, Alex said while eating a piece of pie for lunch. I thought you knew when I brought the pumpkins in and prepared the table, Mrs. Rose responded in a calm tone. I didn't even see you do it, Alex retorted, opening a comic book. Of course not. Harold's voice made itself heard for the first time that day. They're blinded by TV and reading all those drawing books, just like a pair of moles. Mrs. Rose chased the voice away with a wave of her hand. It wasn't their games that had them blind. She knew better than that. Jake's impish grin floated before her eyes once more, proving her point. Something was wrong, all right, but she knew what had to be done, and God's order would soon be restored. Where are your costumes? she asked after dinner, hoping there was at least a bit of innocent childhood left in her grandchildren. Alex looked so cute in his fireman outfit two years ago, and Jake was Superman, both heroic little angels. We're kind of old for trick-or-treat, Jake responded. But I told the neighbors you'd be stopping by, the old lady protested. Yeah, Halloween is kind of lame, Alex chimed in. We want to watch this new horror movie. It just came out on video last week. It's kick at Jake caught himself mid-sentence. It's a cool movie, he finished instead. Mrs. Rose nodded understandingly. Of course they wanted to watch a movie. It was probably one filled with gore and monsters, just like their black box. How foolish of her to think they would enjoy pretending to be heroes. They were too old for that. Now they enjoyed killing defenseless spiders. Of course they would want to stay inside and watch a movie. Of course. As the evening progressed, she handed out candy with a thin smile. She complimented kids on their costumes, kids as old as Jake, maybe even older. Their parents greeted her with wide smiles, clearly proud of their good sons and daughters. It was painful to see them walk away hand in hand and remember the times when her angels ignored her. Then it was all over, the clock close to midnight. So she made herself a cup of tea and waited on the front porch, glancing at the stars and the thin moon which showed her the time was right. Inside the house, cries of help came from the movie and gasps of fear from her grandsons. Listening to them, she worried they would still be awake when the hour came. But then she remembered God kept watch over the good and helped those who were righteous. Before one, the house went silent, and she thanked the heavens. Mrs. Rose waited a few minutes before going back inside, her bones chilled by the long wait and her joints in pain. She made sure the angels were asleep and whispered a short blessing in their doorway. She loved them still, but their fate was in the hands of God. Carefully, she returned downstairs and opened the white door to her pantry and the hidden latch to the basement. A sweet smell of earth and roots filled the air and twisted in the pale light of a single light bulb. It was a simple smell no perfume could match. It was the smell her mother had when she died of old age, close to a 150, maybe more. Crossing herself, 
the old woman stepped on the wooden stairs that creaked in unison with her bones. She waited on the third step for her eyes to adjust to the dark and her mind to recite the ancient prayers. This was the proper way of doing things. The knowledge she received from her mother, the knowledge Dahlia refused the day she chose to leave the old town for a private high school. This was the old, good wisdom she had hoped to pass on to her grandchildren, even though they were boys. Her mother's voice had warned her against this decision, but she had hoped they would be pure enough to carry the old ways onwards nonetheless. She had been wrong. Red eyes sprang alive in the dark, following her descent into the darkness. But Mrs. Rose went on as she did every year on this day, at the hour of one, ready to check on her ancient ward. A tiny spider crawled onto her foot, another soon following. Their tiny legs tickled, setting her blood flowing with speed once more. First her legs, then her belly and wrinkled chest. Finally her arms and neck were covered with invisible feet, carefully massaging her old flesh and healing her skin. She giggled like a schoolgirl at the pleasant reviving touch of the tiny doctors. Then the red eyes approached her. In the dim light cast from above, she could clearly see the white cross of the Lord, stretching almost as large as her own body, God's creation, the miracle of life and motherhood. Her ward was fine. She was pregnant again. Mrs. Rose smiled and lowered her old, dry lips on the fine fur covering the large female spider. She lay her kiss on the white cross and whispered her plea, asking for advice. I need help against the evil. My grandsons, what should I do? The sudden ripple of hundreds of feet, fleeing her body in fear, shook the old lady. This evil must have truly been strong if it scared the tiny doctors. But the mother of thousands stood true, showing her will. Mrs. Rose began the fall harvest. The old woman reached underneath the ancient body of the gigantic spider, where, on the lower belly, dozens of eggs hung tightly. This was a good year, and many brown eggs, covered in soft fuzz, were gathered on the mother's body. Like every November, Mrs. Rose would spread them as far as she could, hiding them in layers of old leaves and attics with hay, anywhere they could survive the winter and avoid evil, so they could burst with life once spring came around. She placed the eggs in her apron, and taking the last two, felt that they were heavier, already pulsating with life. The mother knew what was to be done, and her will was clear to the old woman. Mrs. Rose kissed the spider one last time, whispered her thanks, and feeling refreshed and alive, she left the basement. The last two eggs she carried upstairs into the boy's room. She watched them sleep, one brown egg the size of her fist in each hand. They looked so peaceful as they lay in their beds. A tear ran down her old cheek. Harold's voice began to protest, but she ignored it. She felt young and full of will again, the doing of the tiny doctors, no doubt. She approached the beds and slowly stroked the boys' hair, their beautiful blonde hair. She wished this to be different. She wished that this Halloween she could have shown them the wonders of the mother. But evil reached them first, one year ago. Of course, the medical doctors didn't know what it was. The disease inside their little angelic bodies wasn't anything pills could cure. Only the mother's tiny doctors could cure the evil infecting them. She left the eggs on their chests and turned to leave. There was no need to see the miracle of the mother take place. She saw it once before. Except then it was Harold lying in bed when the egg burst open and hundreds of tiny spiders crawled down his open throat into his diseased body. The little doctors fought the evil from inside for over a month before Harold, poor old evil-infested Harold, died in his bed. She hoped with the boys it would be different. She hoped they would be strong enough to fight against that rotten disease and help the good in them win. Then they would be her angels again, and they would join her in next year's harvest. Mrs. Rose smiled, feeling better than she had in months. By next harvest, she would have her boys back and they would help her spread the mother's will. And if not, well, it was all in the Lord's hands now. Oh! 
Author's note. This story was originally written for a Graveside Tales Halloween anthology, the idea behind it being that grandmas can be scary if given the right circumstances. Oh yeah. That and the ever-present divide between generations, and maybe misinterpretation of religion. Religion always sneaks into my stories, the most likely reason for that being my belief that faith and dedication to a cause always lead to very interesting results. Speaking of which, here is a fun mental exercise I'd love to see tackled in the comments. Was the grandmother figure justified in her actions, or was she just evil? All right. I hope you guys had a good time. And have a good happy Halloween. Can you have a good happy Halloween, or just good or happy? One or the other. Let me ask again. And have a happy good Halloween. Damn it. You know, to tell you the truth, I don't think I've ever had a really memorable Halloween. I've enjoyed taking my kids around, like trick-or-treating and stuff. That's always fun, because kids are really into trick-or-treating. Unless they suck. Zoom, (laughs) jink! It's hard to find a kid who is not excited about going out and getting free candy. And I have one of my kids who's just absolutely nuts for candy. Three guesses as to who that one is. Yeah, three guesses. If she ruled the world, every day would be Halloween, at least for her. You could just, for me, too. Hey. She'd just go around and ask anyone, hey, trick or treat, and they'd have to give her candy. She'd be happy. What was your best Halloween, Rish? You know, Big, I like to think that my best Halloween is right around the corner. That's a really positive outlook. Something I've never heard from you before. Wow. That's why I did it in this funny voice. Some people would know it wasn't really me. Cool. You know, one time when I was a kid, I don't know if this ever happened to you. You soiled yourself? Yes. Yes, as a matter of fact. Today. Yeah, one time as a kid, I shat the bed. (laughs) No, this has to happen to you when you are a bit of an older child. Because when you're a young child, you have to go trick-or-treating with your family. Your mom or somebody's always, like, nearby. But when you get older, they let you go by yourself. You can set your own pace and do your own thing. And so... I went out with my friends trick-or-treating. It was near the end of the night. It was late. We were some of the last kids still out. And we're uh, heading back towards my house. And this car pulls up next to us. And they say, hey, we're looking for this street. And they said the name of some street, which I happen to know because it was a street right near the high school that my older brother and sister went to. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, you go uh, right over to this street. The guy's like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. And so I stepped closer to the car (laughs) and I said, yeah, you go right down here and then you go to this street. And the guy grabbed my bag and they took off and I tried to fight to save my bag of candy, but it was a plastic grocery bag and it ripped off and the guys drove off with my whole bag of candy from the night. I got picked on in a way that normally only Rish Outfield got picked on. How about that? Yeah, the irony is I was in that car. I always wondered what happened to that snotty-faced little kid with the hairy stomach, even then. But wow, so I guess there is some kind of divine intergalactic justice. Intergalactic, yes. They were aliens. Okay, well, what's the word I should have used? I don't know. You know, that does remind me, though. I had this just bizarre experience uh, when I was around the same age. I was too old to go trick-or-treating. But I convinced my parents that that's what I was going out and doing. And and myself, myself. Well, don't you hate people that refer to them as myself and three of my friends? So I and three of my friends, we went to the cemetery, right? And we all got together and we started to chant, I believe in Sadie Worth. Uh, And we were chanting it a few times. And then suddenly you won't believe what. Yeah, the ghost appeared. Yes. Oh, I I know. I've told you this story before. Yes. Well, let me go into better detail. So basically, Big, the old man leaned in, and so did we. And once we were all close, he whispered, I believe in Sadie Worth. Those were the secret hey, words that would bring out the Rish, ghost of Rish, the dead Hey, Rish. And he said, Rish, just, Rish. Yeah. We already did this story, man. And it wasn't even yours, okay? Oh, okay. Well, R-O-E-T, I'm really embarrassed. I just related something that happened to Doug McIntyre is something that happened to me. Could you just cut out maybe the last... 45 seconds of the conversation. The last minute, we'll just make a clean sweep of it. He says, yeah, sure, of course he will. Okay, you're Prince Among Droids, thank you. Really? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, hey, I guess our relationship has evolved. Yeah, it has. It's changed completely. Good. So, Mother's Harvest. You chose this one as our Halloween episode. Why? Because it's scary and Halloween related. I don't know. Good night, everybody. Happy holidays. Good discussion. Wear your seatbelts. No, you know, a funny thing about this story, Alex um, sent this in a while back. We did his story, The Artist, and uh, shortly thereafter, he sent us in this story, and I read it, and I enjoyed it, but I thought, you know, it doesn't really work to run this one in July or June. Basically, this was a story that had to be run around October time. So I said, hey, Alex, we like this story, and we'd like to use it, but it's going to sit for a while. Sorry, man. At least we told him. Most people, we just accept it and then make it sit for a while and then just laugh at them as they're like, hey, uh, any idea on when it's going to air? Speaking of which, working the holiday next week, maybe. Nah, we'll save it for next year. But yeah, I thought it was really creepy. So tell me, Rish, do you agree with Alex Moisey? Do you think grandmas can be scary? No. Listen to last week's episode <laughs> where I talk about the old lady spider walking across the ceiling. Oh, spider walking across the ceiling. I thought she was just at the foot of your bed. Ah, not again. When did it turn into spider walking across the ceiling? <laughs> I guess anything can be really freaky, you know. You know, that might be a fun writing exercise sometime. Come up with like three things that are absolutely not scary. Like Mr. Bubble. Or something like that and say, okay, you have to write a scary story based on one of these things and have it be honestly scary. That could be a fun a little exercise. Maybe that's what originally turned clowns into scary things. Somebody said, let's take things that aren't scary and let's make them scary. And so they started saying, well, clowns are things that people laugh at. Let's make them scary. You know, John Wayne Gacy was a clown. Maybe that was the turning point when suddenly clowns aren't so cool anymore. Interesting. Grandmas and clowns. I want you to write a story about a scary grandma clown. Aren't all my stories deep down about scary grandma clowns? Pretty much. Alex, this was good. He stepped on his recording device or headphones or something like that, so he wasn't able to send us an author's note. But he is he's Bulgarian, Russian, Romanian, and to. now he lives here in the States, so he probably has a unique perspective on Halloween, on everything. Uh, a good friend of mine, he married a Romanian girl, and I used to ask her questions about Romania. And one of the coolest things she ever told me was that Vlad Tepes, the, you know, Dracula, is like this cultural icon akin to George Washington in her country. Because he protected the country from invading forces and was a great leader, and Romania wouldn't be there if it weren't for him. Whereas we have this idea of Dracula as, well, I guess we have several ideas of Dracula, none of which are probably accurate. Anyway, just to hear her talk about the beliefs and the Romany people or gypsies or whatever you want to call them and the, the superstitions of her culture and stuff was fascinating. And that she said she honestly had never heard that Dracula was a vampire until she came to America. And I was just like, wow, because, you know, that's his defining aspect here, you know. That's cool. Was it a conscious decision not to bring somebody from the outside in to do Mrs. Rose's voice? Or was it the fact that Abby is out of town? Um, it wasn't because Abby was out of town. I thought that you do a good old lady voice, and so it would be perfect for you. Well, thank you. That's kind of you to say. Going back to the uh, woman called witch story and giving you a second chance to redeem yourself. Well, back in the woman called witch days, it was really hard to find a female reader to do characters for us. And so I don't know if we would have had somebody be woman called witch. I think it worked out fine, but of course I'm yeah, biased. I don't think we would change things up. Sometimes I feel like we're spoiled because we have so many people who are willing to help yeah. us. And like when we had Danny Cutler read the other day, mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I didn't even know who she was. And she did a whole dang story with like 43 characters and all that. was just like, wow, we have this great talent pool we can draw, draw from. Yes, thank you. And so a lot of times we just take it for granted that somebody else will do voices for us when it's probably fine. I mean, how many podcasts have you heard where one reader does all of the voices and you never blink? That's pretty standard. And that's the way audiobooks are usually done as well. Definitely. Every now and then you'll get like a chapter of Ender's Game or something like that where all the Blackstone audio actors come in and do a voice of this character, that character, and the other. But that doesn't happen very often. When did we run Origin of Sounds? 
couple weeks two, ago. Two, three weeks ago. And that was just you and me like it was when we very, very first started. You know, I hope people don't feel disappointed when it's like that. Sometimes stories lend themselves to a huge cast. Like next week's, we're, we've got so much to say about next week's story. We're already saying it in this one. <laughs> That's just taken months. And we've probably got 12 or 13 different voice people, right? On that one? You might be exaggerating, but we got a few. We got a few. But yeah, it definitely took longer to put together because of it. Oh, so what I was getting to before I got sidetracked was, uh, you know, I imagine that somebody who comes from the old country, from the old world, mm -hmm. like Alex does, has a very different concept of Halloween in their mind. And here, of course, we've commercialized it. Right. And made it into a kid's holiday. Yeah. Kids and serial killers really have a good time. On and what kid Halloween. isn't a serial killer deep down? And candy stealers. <laughs> but, you know... My aunt, I think I've talked about my aunt before because she, uh, on the, the air. She really hates everything that I love, pretty much. <laughs> um, but she was one of those women that wouldn't allow her kids to celebrate Halloween. And she wouldn't answer the door for trick-or-treaters. She would turn out all the lights and just lock the doors. Sometimes they would leave town, honestly, on Halloween huh. night so that there would not be any... Whether it was temptation for the kids to see other kids with candy or having fun, God forbid... <laughs> on this darkest of all nights. And she was one that would always tell my mom, well, you know, you know where Halloween comes from or what Halloween is really about. And I think she's one of those people that persists in the, oh, you know what those Disney movies are really saying. <laughs> and you know that up is just a thinly veiled euthanasia metaphor, teaching our children that it's okay to let old people die. Anyhow, she's one of those. Um, and I disagree with a lot of things that she says and, and did in those days. But regardless of what Halloween once was, what Halloween once represented, I think most of the occult aspect has completely been dollar signed out. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, people can pound the pulpit of what a bad thing Halloween is. But just the whole satanic origins of the other side, that just doesn't fly anymore. It's yeah. kind of like saying, well, you know, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas because it used to be a Druid right. you know, celebration and all that. And it's like, well, it's not what it is anymore uh, or has been for a long, long time. And right. Halloween's the same way. And you know how you'll hear that Christmas was sort of going out of fashion when Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol. And then suddenly in English society, they were like, by Jove, that was a wonderful celebration our grandparents had. Uh, and now I don't know if that's apocryphal, if that actually happened, huh. but... This book celebrated the past of Christmas and the traditions that were gone and, and that maybe had been swallowed up in the hustle and bustle of modern life. And I made quotes in the air when I said modern. And then suddenly people started to embrace the traditions and Christmas was bigger than it ever had been before. Now, I, I don't know that it was just Dickens, but there, there had to have been something that suddenly made Halloween a big deal in America. You know what I mean? Yeah. One night on American movie classics, they had Meet Me in St. Louis on, right? Okay. Meet Me in St. Louis is a musical that is set at the turn of the century in St. Louis. And uh, you know what's funny is you can't say turn of the century and mean 1900 anymore. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And everybody listening knows exactly what you're talking about but we've had another turn of the century yeah since then. i'm gonna have to it was set no 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 they know when it was I, set continue I, i'm sorry i, I didn't mean say to interrupt it. you right how, you how, it how right. do you how do you say it now do you have to say the turn of i don't think you do a lot of people <laughs> a decade ago were calling it the new millennium right and you know i think a lot of people probably still do uh-huh say you know the turn of the new millennium. Yeah, or when Y2K came. Uh. You know, I always wanted to make like a fake documentary that showed how widespread the disaster was when Y2K <laughs> happened. And you used just all sorts of footage from wars and everything that came before and after and pretend that it was Y2K. And we were this close to going out forever. But yeah, there's nothing you can, you can say. I mean. No, no, turn of the century. Let's let's rewind. But I, Go I'm, on ahead. No, we can. I'm. I want to come up with it with what would the phrase be that you could say now that we've had a new turn of the century? Would you have to say the turn of the last century? Just say the century? turn of the last century. That sounds good. Or the turn of when 1900? So anyways, it's set in, in the turn of the century of the last century. 
and there's a scene in there where it's Halloween time. And it was the oddest crap that was going on. There's this younger girl. She's like eight or nine or something like that. And she's supposed to be one of the big main characters. She was the cutesy Shirley Temple type character in this thing. She gets dressed up as like a bum or a hobo or a hobo clown or I don't know what the heck it was. Some crappy old costume. And so she goes out and and it's all the older boys are doing their Halloween. They're getting Halloween ready. They're like building this gigantic bonfire. They're throwing like chairs and crap on this thing. And they're all a bunch of kids, like 13 or less building this giant bonfire. And they're going around and killing everyone in town. And the, what they're doing is... This sounds like my childhood. <laughs> Killing? Yes. And the way they kill somebody is they go to their house. Oh, and, and she takes a bag of flour with her. Okay. <laughs> she goes out to this thing with this bag of flour. And they go to the people's houses and they have to say, I hate you, Mr. Robinson or Mr. Jones, and throw flour on them. And that's how you kill somebody. And for some reason, this is supposed to be a very scary thing to do. And so this little girl is like really scared. To, and they're like, you go kill the Robinsons and you kill the Harrises. So she goes up to the house and she's all scared. She knocks on the door and the guy opens the door and he stands there and he's like, well, and then finally she says, I hate you, Mr. Harris and she throws flour on him it was just the weirdest thing and i i wonder if that was some kind of a widespread tradition to do this and how something like that evolved into going trick-or-treating i'm not sure and i'm not sure if that was really the way it was or i don't see why someone would make up some crazy tradition to put in a movie but it, it was a very strange thing me and my wife both were just sitting there watching that going what the f is going on here should i bleep that if you want okay well see you know in my village we had this strange custom that was kind of like that too and it was just this this festival the harvest festival kind of thing uh that was we called it char you tree and, and everybody would make a stuffy guy <laughs> and we would throw it upon the fire and, and it was supposed to be an offering to make sure that you know there, there was a good harvest and uh-huh char you tree <laughs> frank muller in your mind there was a door. Halloween, regardless of its origins, is just – it's bigger than all of us now. And I imagine on Martian colonies they will celebrate Halloween, even if they don't have a harvest, even if they don't have October as we know it. You know, there's just too much money involved to make Halloween go away. Too many industries, depending on Halloween – I wouldn't be surprised if like all the candy companies look at Halloween the way that toy companies look at Christmas. Uh-huh. You know, obviously these costume places depend on Halloween. Right. And decorations and there are probably a lot of horror movies that the only time they get played is is during October. You know, some actor whose bread and butter is okay, Robert England. He waits all year for his October residual checks because all the tv stations are going to be playing his movies and i was like oh i don't know i love halloween i i would live in halloween town from nightmare before christmas (laughs) you know other people probably don't feel the way i do about halloween uh you know there may be people who who like scary things but like it in its place Mm -hmm. and feel that october maybe the last week of october or the last day is where that kind of it. stuff belongs. And the rest of the year, they want flowers and sunshine and well, Bobby Darren records. Okay. Those are nice in that, springtime. Do you think I dated myself by saying <laughs> No, no. I, I, I Let me update the reference. Something modern. I mean, holy cow. Uh, okay. So flowers and sunshine and Leif Garrett records. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. But uh, we tend to try and play scary stories all year round. Like every three or four episodes, it's going to be another horror story Uh because I love it. And uh, you seem to not have a problem with it. No. And then, yeah, so October, we we saved up three scary stories for the month. That's right. And we've got the October scary story event going right now. I don't know that we mentioned it, but let's mention it right now. Yeah, let's. uh, The event's going on all month. I know the month is almost over now. But if you're anything like me, you haven't written up word that's right same here so So it's not too late it's not too late liz mirzievsky had her entire story done by the fifth that's true she must just make you sick she wrote it in a couple of days which means it's still possible 
if you're a writer like Liz Mirzieski to pound one out. You have I'm actually do... an expert on pounding one out. Uh, it goes back to my Leif Garrett poster. <laughs> should, should I say Scott Bayo? No, that's fine. I just didn't think you were going to go there. So you haven't written a story? I don't plan to. You son of a... <laughs> you and your <laughs> October scary story event. It was your idea to hold one this year. I was looking at you and I said, do you feel up to doing an October Scary Story event this year? Because we just finished the darn... That's I won't right. even say the name because I don't have the sound effect handy. And I said, hell yeah! Did you really? Did you point I did. Like I that? think I said it a couple of times. Oh, no. I'm going to have to write a story now. So anyways, let me just quickly explain and then I'm going to head off and write my story. You got to write a scary story within the month of October. That's the deal. And then send it in to us, and the best ones will be episodes of our show. And I'll tell you what, deadline, November 2nd. So that means you've got all day October 31st to finish writing it, and you can take November 1st to proofread or rewrite or whatever, it is, and send that to us, and uh, hopefully it'll be a blast. Hope I, and you know what? If there are 10 great stories, then maybe we've got our horror allotment for the rest of the year. Yeah, th that might be the case. So yeah, go for it. You still got some time. I don't know that we have time left in our podcast. We will let everybody go out, get your bags of flour, and do your Halloween thing. That's right. Go and kill Mr. Harris, all right? That's your assignment. <laughs> just, just, just give his address and then... <laughs> give his address and get it over with. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. I am the one hiding under your stairs. Fingers like snakes and spiders in my hair. This, this is Halloween. This is Halloween. Halloween. Pumpkin scream in the dead of night. This is Halloween. Everybody. Warning. Make a Today's sing. episode Drink contains singing. Gonna die Thank you for listening. Time. Do you have something Everyone to say about scream. today's episode? This Drop by our website at dunesteve.com and leave a Halloween. comment. This is the Doonsteve Audio Fiction Magazine is published Halloween. under a creative Halloween. Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivative. Derivatives license. No this means that you may share these files scare. with anyone, Sorry, but you may not charge not for them or alter them. The town of Halloween. In this town. Don't we love it now? Take two. The two started uh. burping. Jake, that's quite inappropriate. I will light a candle for you, Belchin boy. <laughs>